Thanks, Joanne. Thank you, Joanne. You always start with a joke, so let me start with a joke. I, I live in Washington, D.C. This is a joke that's making the rounds. Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton die on the same day. Because they die on the same day, they both go before their maker to be judged on the same day. So God is sitting resplendent on a throne of shimmering gold. And this, this joke requires me to do a God voice, so I've got to do a God voice. I won't make any judgments about the gender of God, but the, the maker is sitting resplendent on the throne of shimmering gold. And he turns first to the former senator from New York and says, Hillary Clinton, what do you believe? And Hillary launches into this really long spiel about infrastructure banks and positive engagement and campaign finance reform. And she's kind of going on and on. And it's hard to tell what her subject is. And she starts denying all these things about emails and land deals and Monica Lewinsky. And she's going on and on. In the life to come, time doesn't have the same meaning that it has among us mortals here on Earth. So it's hard to really say how long Hillary talks. But let's just say the cherubim, those little baby angels, they all fall asleep on their floating clouds. And, and at one point she finally says, and in conclusion, and everybody snaps back to attention and Hillary finishes and then she checks her Blackberry and then sits down. <laughs> so, so God says, well, Hillary, that was inspirational. You've lived a good life. I offer you admission to paradise. And Hillary Clinton is surrounded by a shaft of ethereal light and she vanishes into heaven. God then turns to the 45th president of the United States and says, Donald Trump, what do you believe? And Trump gives him that beady-eyed sneer and says, I believe you're sitting in my chair. <laughs> so, that's an actual Washington joke that cuts a little too close to home. Uh, this is the book I want to talk about. The headline makes it the main point of the book pretty obvious. Uh, Sometimes when, you, when, when, you, when you're doing an intellectual argument, it's easiest to start by saying what it isn't. So let me start by saying what this isn't. Uh, to say it's better that it looks and to make a case for optimism is not the same as saying that everything is fine. Everything is not fine. The world is full of problems. There's a lot of things you should be worried about. There's a lot of things you should be upset or cynical about. There's a lot of things going on in the world that you should be angry about. So I don't say that you shouldn't be angry, that you shouldn't be cynical. I expect you to be. But there's, well, to jump ahead, to jump ahead a bit, a point. The difference between optimism and pessimism is that pessimists think that the things that you should be angry and cynical about are going to overwhelm us. And optimists think that they can be fixed. And that's the main argument of this book, that, that first you have, to, you have to see how much the world has improved to the present day, and then you have to use the lessons that you can draw from that to see how we can fix the problems that face us today. Uh, this book is also not a claim that we should be cheerful. If you want to be cheerful, that's great. I hope you are. Go around the world with a smile on your face. An optimist can be a cynical person. An optimist can be very upset reading the newspaper in the morning. You don't have to be cheerful. You don't have to snice if you smile, but you don't have to. Uh, our feelings should be based, I guess a better way to say it is, whether you feel pessimistic or optimistic about the world has two levels. One is the, just a the choice that you make. You read the news, you hear what's going on, you decide, am I going to be optimistic? Am I going to be angry and depressed? That's a choice that you make. The news does not dictate those things to you. But whatever choice you make ought to be based on a, on a full factual appreciation of what's going on in life. And a full factual appreciation is pretty encouraging because I, I hope I can be able to show you in a few minutes practically everything that we can measure about the United States is positive and has been positive for years, if not decades. And not the entire world, but most of the larger world most of what we can measure about the larger world is positive and in many cases has been positive for decades. So if you acknowledge those things, there's still a lot to worry about. There's still a lot to be angry about. And there are always going to be people who have terrible circumstances, in either individuals or, depending on where you go in the world, entire groups. There's never going to be a time when there isn't someone who is lonely or stressed for money or sick or unhappy, I mean, unless, we, unless there's a second Garden of Eden, that 
there'll never be a time without that. But there, but there can be a time when basic problems of human life are fun, when the material problems of life are solved. And I think we've gone a lot closer to that than people, people realize. Um, in order to present the thesis of this book to you in a timely manner, let me do a couple of things. First, to make a political point, this book is not mainly about politics, it's mainly about other things. And, and then hit you with a lot of statistics. Uh, and then ask why we're, so many of us are so negative about life. And then because this is the Carnegie Council, we will always, of course, conclude by asking, but what does it all mean? Uh, the, the, first thing I'll, the first point that I'll make is the political one. The, on the day that the United States elected Donald Trump president, 63 million people voted for a guy who told you that the world was falling apart, just to quote a few things that he said in the week before the election, everything in America is always bad. It's always down, down, down. He told an audience in Colorado two days before the election that the country is in the worst shape that it's ever been in its entire history. On the day that 63 million people believed that, the country was actually in the best shape that it's ever been in its history by a pretty significant margin. And I, I, I think now it's in a better shape than it was on the day of election. Trump aside, everything else has gone pretty well. And yet he was able to convince 63 million people that the country was falling apart. And you can say, well, we make this choice. You want to be optimistic. You want to be pessimistic. Pessimistic, that's just a personal choice. On some level it is. But in November of of 2016, it backfired on the country. People's willingness to believe that everything was terrible as a factual truth caused us to get Donald Trump as president. And it wasn't just here. The same sequence of events happened in the United Kingdom, which voted for Brexit in, in, in the year since the founding of the European Union. There's been no Europe on Europe war. After how many centuries of constant war? There's been prosperity in almost all European Union members, and yet people were convinced that the European Union is, is a horrible thing that we have to get rid of. I'll argue that the, that the belief that the world is worse than it is, and almost the desire to believe that the world is worse than it is, it definitely predates Donald Trump. Um, but in 2016, it backfired on us by giving us Trump, and to, to a lesser extent, also giving us Brexit, which you know maybe Brexit can be reversed. Trump is another matter. Uh, now here's the, here's the lots of statistics ver moment of this talk, and I'll go through them as quickly as I can, and I'll assure you that, of course, as, you, as you've already guessed, incredible detail in the book plus source citations for everything. Okay, so the things that we can measure about the, I'll talk mainly about the United States and Western Europe, but most of these trends apply to most, although of course not all of the world. All forms of disease, including cancer and heart disease, are in long-term decline. Compared to population size, last year the United States had 75% fewer heart attack fatalities than it had just two generations ago. Longevity has been steadily rising for more than a century everywhere in the world, everywhere in the world. Not only is our longevity at record levels, China's longevity is at record levels, Afghanistan's longevity is at record levels. Everybody is living longer with less disease. The graph of rising longevity looks like an escalator, just endlessly going up. And there's no reason to think that's going to stop, even, even when terrible things happen. And lots of terrible things happen in the United States. They, you, you've read about opi opiate, that's hard to say, overdose death. This is, it's a terrible trend in public health. But even when you take that into account, longevity continues to increase. The whole world is riding this longevity increase escalator. All forms of pollution, other than greenhouse gases are in long-term decline for years, in some cases for decades. Now, greenhouse gases, very important asterisk that we're going to spend a little time on later. But, 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 but to quickly summarize, in the United States, last 25 years, acid rain is down 21%. Winter smog is down 77%. Summer smog is down 22%. This is happening during a period when the United States population rose by 28%. So we would expect pollution to increase, instead pollution declined. Water pollution figures are, are roughly the same. Violent crime is in a generation-long cycle of decline. Polls show Donald Trump, when he was campaigning for office, constantly said there's a crime wave, our cities are living hell. For some reason, that's what voters wanted to believe. Polls showed that for the last 20 years, Americans have consistently said crime is worse than the previous year. Actually, it's gone down compared to the previous year. Even if you take into account just horrifying events 
like the one last week in, in Parkland, Florida, gun homicides are in a generation-long cycle of decline here in New York City. 1993 was the peak year for gun homicides. There were 3,528 gun homicides that year. Last year in, the United, in New York City, there were 286 gun homicides, less than 10% of the number of just 25 years ago. Now, the only number you can tolerate is zero, and we're not there yet, but in the United States and in most but not all other countries of the world, violence is declining. Criminal violence is declining, so is military violence. War is in a generation-long cycle of decline. This may seem hard to believe based on the tenor of cable news, but the frequency and intensity of combat both have declined almost on a linear basis for 25 years, and that's even if you take into account civilian deaths caused directly by combat or indirectly by, by blockades and similar effects of combat. Last 25 years, death from war have declined to about 5% of the rate of deaths from war that prevailed per year, of the, the rate that prevailed for the previous century. In each one of the last 25 years, a person's chance, any person's chance, not my chance and your chance, but anybody, any in the, anywhere in the world, chance of dying has been at the lowest level of human history. And this is even though the population keeps rising, we normally think of population stress as causing combat. It's not causing combat right now. And even though the world is full of guns, the, uh, the chances that someone will shoot one of them at you goes steadily down. Now, this, 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 I'm only talking about a period of 25 years. Maybe this is too too little time to be sure, but in this 25-year period when war has declined, my two favorite statistics, there's a little more than 25 years, is 30 years. Today, there are 86% fewer nuclear weapons in the world than there were 30 years ago. Now, the 4,000 nuclear weapons that still exist are still plenty to cause the greatest tragedy of all history, but 30 years ago, it would have caused the end of life, and that's not probably physically possible now. The doomsday threat has declined by 86% in just 30 years. We hope it will decline more, but if you think about U.S.-Russian relations, now it, uh, they're so zany, I don't even know what the pr proper adjective is to describe them, but, but what, whatever, whatever the Kremlin and the White House are saying to each other today, communicating by smartphone instead of by, by red phone, meanwhile, the two START treaties that require the, the disassembly and melting of nuclear weapons parts are still being scrupulously observed by both sides. Both sides are abiding by the terms of the biggest arms control treaty in the history of the world. And day-to-day -day life goes on anyway. There's no reason anybody should think, well, you know, I still, have to, I still have to go to work in the morning. I still have to make lunch, etc. This to me is a wonderful trend. The doomsday threat declines every day instead of enlarging, instead of rising every day. The other milita military statistic that I think is a great statistic is that for all but two of the last 30 years, global per capita military spending has declined. But as, as the world gets more crowded, we spend steadily less on bombs and warplanes and warships than we spent in the past. Now, again, there's no guarantee, it's only 25, 30 year trend, but traditionally military buildups and arms races have led to war. Now we're in an unprecedented period in the industrial era where there aren't any arms races. Arms spending is declining in almost every nation. Hopefully it will not, hopefully the result will be no war. A couple more big statistics. Food supply has not become a crisis as everyone thought it would 25, 30 years ago. Instead, as of last year, the United Nations said that malnutrition was at the lowest level in all of human history. Malnutrition last year was 15 to 20 percent of the plant. That's still a huge number of people considering how large the human family is. But just a generation ago, malnutrition was 50 percent of a much smaller human family. Now it's down to a smaller number. It's expected to decline again this year. There's no reason to believe that we're going to run out of food in any conceivable scenario generations to come in the future. The same for primary resources. You all know in the 1970s it was widely believed that petroleum and natural gas would be literally exhausted by now. There's so much petroleum that the oversupply of petroleum is a problem for financial markets. Same thing with natural gas, same thing with coal. It's almost like God's joke on the world because there's 
so much fossil fuel that we're using it to create global warming with. But we're definitely not running out of it. The economy drives everybody crazy, but it continues to grow almost everywhere in the world. And an important point to remember about, about income and wages, since they were so contentious in the 2000 campaign, both 2016 campaign, both, both Donald Trump and Bernie Sanders constantly said the middle class is being pummeled, wages are falling, there are no jobs. On the day that Trump was elected, unemployment was 4.6%, a number that would have caused policymakers of the 1970s to fall to their knees and kiss the ground. Uh, the unemployment picture is really good and has been for a number of years, but so is, so is the middle class buying power picture if you figure it this way. If you only look at pre-tax income, that's been a tough number for the middle class now for about 30 years. If that's the only number you look at, and that's the only number that Bernie Sanders ever talked about, then it looks pretty bleak. But you don't run your household based on only income. Your, your, your buying power is based on income minus taxes plus benefits multiplied by consumer prices divided by household size. And if you do that equation, what you find is that ever since the end of World War II, the middle class's buying power has risen by just about exactly 3% per year. Uh, again, almost like an escalator basis, same amount every year, straight line. If times are good, if times are bad, middle class buying power rise goes up 3% per year. And of course, you know from mathematics, if something goes up 3% per year, it takes you 26 years to double. So that is still ongoing. Uh, pundits and politicians talk only about income. Income is the negative number when you, when you look at wages. All the other numbers are positive. Now, of course, there's no guarantee that they will stay that way. The economy is so turbulent and so unpredictable. Even if you have a good year, it drives you crazy. And I, I think one reason people feel so worried about the economy is things change so fast. Now, they, they have changed fast in the past. There, you can look at the 19th century, and I give some examples here from the 19th century where, where people and organizations, industries, areas of the country were worried that change was coming too quickly. There's no doubt that it comes even quicklier, even quicklier, even faster now. And that makes you feel uncertain and anxious about the future. But so far, the economy is still grinding out higher living standards for almost everyone. Generations alive today in almost any nation of the world are better off in material terms than any generation of the past and are likely, although of course not certain, but they're likely to be better off in the future as well. And the most important fact that we're not sufficiently aware of is that global poverty is declining really fast. Uh, if you look at global poverty numbers, here's a few quick ones. 150 years ago, 90% of the world lived in extreme poverty by the World Bank definition of uh, income of $1.90 per day. And of course, the statistics I'll give you all converted to current dollars to make the comparisons meaningful. Sometime in the 1970s, the world got to only half the human population living in extreme poverty, and that was considered an incredible achievement. Uh, last year, it was 9%. We're down to 9% of the human population living in extreme poverty. And this incredible reduction of extreme poverty has occurred as the human family has gotten larger and larger and larger, when you would have expected extreme poverty to get worse. Instead, it's lessened. Now, we can't see that from the United States or from, when you're voting on Brexit, you can't see it from the United Kingdom. The, the line I use about this is that the great things are happening in the world, just not here. We're, we're, we're aware of the conditions in our own country. It doesn't seem so great. Progress doesn't seem to be accelerating to us. Go to China, you go to India, progress is accelerating all around you. And because the human family has become so large, more members of the human family live in those places than live in here in, in Western Europe combined. Polls show, by the way, that it, when you ask Americans and Western Europeans, is developing world poverty getting better or worse? They say by an overwhelming margin, margin that developing world poverty is getting worse, which is the reverse of what's going on. Well, we seem to think the reverse of what's going on on a number of, of topics. Americans think crime is getting worse. They think the economy is falling apart, et cetera, et cetera. Well, why do people believe the reverse of what's happening? One reason is just the relentlessly negative impression given by cable news and social channels, which exist to overstate anger and discord and negative news. That's how they call attention to themselves. It's certainly true that the press has always called attention to itself by emphasizing the negative. You look at newspapers from the 1880s and you'll see 
the front page of the paper is all f fires and crimes, and if you want to flip through and find out what's going on in other nations or other states, you've got to go to the middle of the paper. So it's not new that, that the media emphasizes the negative, but now we have these new forms of media all around us that are very felicitous in terms of quickly getting messages to large numbers of people, and they are also emphasizing the negative. Uh, I think people want to believe the worst because they think that optimism means complacency. One of the big messages that I try to get across in this book is that optimism is not complacency. Optimists don't think la-di-da, everything's going to be fine. Optimism is the belief that problems can be solved. That's the fundamental difference between optimism and pessimism. But people think, you say, oh, I'm an optimist, that means you've got this sunny disposition. You think everything's okay. You think it's okay that Trump is president. You think it's okay that there are school shootings. No, optimists don't think that's okay. They just think that there are possible reforms to, that can do something about this. And I'll tell you, I'll, I'll quickly go through this, because you've probably heard some of this material from other commentators in recent months. The, if you look at polling data, Pew and Gallup both poll on the question of, do you think the country is headed in the right direction or the wrong direction? Are you satisfied or dissatisfied with how things are changing in the United States? From the end of World War II to the year 2004, Americans were always positive on that poll. I like the direction of the country. I think things are getting better. People said this even in the aftermath of 9-11. Since 2004, the majority has been consistently negative. This is the 168th consecutive month where Americans have told both Pew and Gallup that they are unhappy and dissatisfied with the condition of the country, despite all those wonderful facts I just wrote you. Well, what else happened in 2004? That's the year that Facebook went into business. Now, of course you know that the fact that two events happen at the same time does not establish that one caused the other. But I think in this case there's a lot of relationship, and not just Lately, it's been, been, it's been trendy to pile on Facebook. I would like to pile on Facebook, but, uh, but also to all other similar social media platforms. They've all come into existence in that period. This thing, that the, the iPhone came into existence in 2007. It changed, not, not only did it allow people, allow is the wrong word, did, not only did it enable millions of people to express their opinions very quickly, which is wonderful. You've got to respect the democratization of opinion. But it also enabled millions of people to say things that were not in any way fact-checked or <clears throat> that were not in any way true, and making no distinction whatsoever between things that are true, things that might be true, things that contain a grain of truth, and things that are totally made up. You, you may, the, sometimes, you, most of you probably read the New York Times, there are mornings when I want to throw the New York Times against the wall. And yet I'm always confident that there's been an internal argument at the Times about whether this story is fair and reflects the truth. The stuff you see on your phone, there's never any internal discussion about whether it's fair or it reflects the truth. In fact, it's more likely to draw clicks if it's made up and completely phony. So we have this new media environment just since 2004 with the arrival of Facebook that not only emphasizes reasons to feel bad about your life and your, yourself and your society, but that does not fact check in any way whatsoever. And where do we perceive this? This close to our faces. Facebook was originally something for your desk, those old cathode ray tube computers that sat on your desk. E even the guys who designed Facebook didn't realize that it was going to go like this, literally right next to their face. That, that wasn't what they meant with the name, but that's what's happened since. So we're not only getting a constant stream of bad news that's completely unedited, we're physically holding it close to our faces. And your New York Times, like it or hate it, it sits on the table. If you get up and go somewhere else, the New York Times does not follow you through the house. If you've got the, if you've got the news on on your television set, the television set sits on a counter around the wall. The television set doesn't walk behind you as you go through your house. Your phone follows you through the house. The bad news purveyor is physically on your person constantly. And so from the same moment that social media came on the scene, we started feeling bad about ourselves. And whatever else Donald Trump is, he's the greatest self-promoter in world history, he realized that he could use that dynamic to go all the way to the White House, and he was successful. Now let me skip ahead. For, in the interest of time, let's turn to the, to the implications of, of my argument, because of course we want to do 
Q&A too. Suppose I'm right that most objective returns are positive for most people and that today's generation lives better than any previous generation of the past and tomorrow's generation is better to live, likely to live better than today's generation does. What are, what are the implications of that? Suppose I'm right. Well, the fact that things are improving certainly isn't just good luck. Positive trends don't come down from out of the sky. There are tangible reasons that things are improving. And the most primary one, I go through a lot in this book, but the most primary one is that reform is much more effective than generally understood. Political reforms, social reforms that have to do with how we treat each other at home, social settings in the workplace, technological reforms that have to do with how we build things. Their reforms are much more effective than we think. Reforms in the past have almost always led to improved outcomes. So I, I both spend some time trying to derive what the lessons learned would be from the reforms that have been successful in air pollution, health, discrimination, etc. And then say, how do you apply those to the problems of today? I have a chapter on climate change, totally real, scientifically confirmed. The question, is, the question of whether it's happening is now a dead issue. The question is, what do we do about it? So I have a chapter showing how you could take the lessons of air pollution control from the past and apply them to greenhouse gases, fundamentally an air pollution problem. How would you use the the successful lesson from acid rain and smog applied to global warming. I have a chapter on inequality. I think inequality is going to turn out to be the Super Bowl of sociological issues. And I think not to, I'm sorry to mix metaphors, I think all roads lead to some version of universal basic income. Exactly what it will be, I don't know. It's going to be very expensive, very complicated. It's going to change society in a lot of ways. I think all roads, all, 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 at least all the roads that you want to go down lead to some version of that concept. And, and, and I spend a chapter looking at other types of sociological reforms having to do both with money and the way that we treat each other that have been successful, ones that have failed, taking the lessons from the ones that succeeded, finding the red flags of the ones that have failed, and thinking about how we would apply them to inequality. Um, my core finding is that optimism is the best argument for reform. Because you, if, you, if you're an optimist and you look at the past and say, geez, things were a lot worse and then they got better, so let's reform things again because there's reasonable reason to believe that reforms will be successful. That's the optimistic lesson that you draw from, especially from the post-war era in the Western world, but, but really from the post-war era almost everywhere in the world. Uh, and I think once we address climate change, inequality, I think we can actually fix those things. We'll wonder why we didn't do it sooner. Now some other problem will come along that will seem daunting and we'll figure out a way to, to fix that too. Um, I'll tell you one last thing and then I'll take questions. Originally the title of this book was The Arrow of History. And this morning the Boston Globe referred to this book as The Arrow of History. So they're using the original title, not the, not the as published title. My public affairs books thought the, edit, the, this is Jamie Leifer of Public Affairs sitting right here, thought the original title was, sounded too much like an academic tome. And you know what, they were right about that. I, I think they came up with a better title than that. But why did I call it the arrow of history? Um, the original title was a play on something said by Franklin Roosevelt shortly before he died. I, this is an, a, a 1945 FDR quote. FDR was the most accomplished reformer of the last century. And he said, and I and just in the original title changed the word trend to arrow because I thought it sounded classier. But anyway, Roosevelt said, the great fact to remember is that the trend of civilization is forever upward. Well, FDR was right then and he's right today. We've forgotten this great fact. We need to remember it, both to have a fuller appreciation of our own lives and to argue for the next round of reforms to come. Thanks. to thank you for drowning out the drumbeat of despair. So I'm sure there are a lot of questions and I will invite you to come to the microphone on either side and please introduce yourself and keep your questions brief and to the point. And if that rings, you can answer and tell them where you are. <laughs> we'll start over here. Tell them I changed the title too. It's better than it looks. Um, I'm Don Simmons. Hi, Don. Uh, inequality is an issue on everybody's mind, I think. Um, and it, much of it seems to be driven 
by the onrush of artificial intelligence, not only from the viewpoint of eliminating driving jobs in our country and so on, but I read an article recently where um, Indian economists are very concerned that those call center jobs yeah. that have been so important in their country will begin disappearing with artificial intelligence. Can you say some comforting words about why artificial intelligence is not going to master us? I can be <laughs> indirectly comforting on that subject. The, the Indian call center question is a great one. I have a lifelong association with the Atlantic Monthly, which is a wonderful publication, my favorite publication, the same in the whole world. I wish the Atlantic Monthly could follow you from room to room because it's a great publication. In a, around 1980, I'm doing that from memory, it was one of the 80, 81, somewhere in there, they ran an article about how horrifyingly awful it was to work in an AT&T operator switching center, switching telephone calls. How it was dehumanizing, it was boring, you were timed on how quickly you could switch the calls, etc. It sounded really awful. And that article ended with a call for higher wages and better working conditions with, for AT&T switching center workers. What happened was that all their jobs were eliminated. AT&T doesn't have any switching center workers anymore. It's all done by computer. And that's coming for a lot of professions. Call centers in India, it hasn't come for white collar professionals yet, but it may be. The semi-comforting thought that I can give you is if you look at the past, people have, made, have had the same worry about technological change in the past a lot. I say in the book, a hundred years ago, when 88%, I think that's the right figure, of Americans worked in agriculture. If you had been, if we'd had, if the Carnegie Council was meeting 80, it was meeting 100 years ago, and I said, well, 88% of Americans work in agriculture. By the year 2018, only one and a half percent of Americans would work in agriculture. You would say, we're all going to be out of jobs. There's going to be no food. Everything's going to collapse. Well. We're not only all out of jobs, we have record employment in every possible level, and everybody's better off, there's plenty of food, and farmers are happier than they've ever been before. So I think the same thing is going to happen with almost every application of technology, but because the economy is so unpredictable and so turbulent, I can't be sure of that. And you can't be sure of it, nobody can be sure of it. We're, we're, we take this huge gamble with society that economic change will mostly lead to better things for most people. So far, that's almost always been the pattern. There is no guarantee that that pattern will continue. It's possible that AI could turn out to be a horrible mistake, or it could just be another innovation that makes life better, like past innovations. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Sir? Sir? Oh, you're going to call. Okay, you, you call. Him. There you go. Could I, <clears throat> I remember coming here from England about 40 years ago. After could you studying. introduce yourself, please? What? Could you introduce yourself so we... Oh, Anthony Liversedge, Science Guardian. Um, I remember coming here 40 or even longer years ago, having studied economics in England and uh, hoping or expecting that the work week would rapidly go down from 40, years to, uh, 40 hours a week to 36 hours to 30, and it didn't happen. It went in the opposite direction, it seems. You have wives coming into the labor market, and more work being done than ever for longer hours. How, how can you say that's a positive trend uh, that will reverse in some way? Maybe technology will have its limitations in replacing people. I don't know. I just wonder what your optimism is based on. I think the, well, here's 380 pages of answer to you, but, but I, I think the main trend in that case, if you look at any point in the past, I think the way to frame this issue is to ask yourself, so you came to the United States 40 years ago, did you say? 40 or 50. Yeah. Go back 40 years in the past and become an average person, an average American, American, average Britain then. Would you prefer to live that life with the health care of that period, with the communications of that period? Would you prefer to live and with the number of nuclear warheads that were in the world 40 years ago? Is that the life you would prefer? Or would you prefer the life of today even knowing that the life of today has all kinds of problems, including that your work follows your home. That's, that's how to frame the issue. Could I just ask one factual check? Uh, you say that uh, there are fewer nuclear missiles around, but in fact, there seem to be 475 missiles ringing uh, the three states pointed at Russia, each with 18 kiloton, kiloton warheads, I understand. Um, 
and the total I thought was something like 6,000. I heard, I think you said 4,000. Are we sure that the number has gone down and that the power has gone down? Yes, that's, that's the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists number. That they're the ones who published the Doomsday Clock. And their number of total warheads in the world 30 years ago was 66,000. Now they say there's 4,000. And, and, and if the START treaties continue to be observed, that number will go down some, somewhat more, not to the level of total disarmament. Total disarmament is a controversial con, con, concept in and of itself. But, but uh, U.S. and Russia and have, have really uh, observed that treaty very nicely. And international treaties are better than ones of the past. You remember how, how the treaties that ended World War I were ignored by all parties. The treaties on nuclear disarmament have been, have been followed by all parties. And the Chinese, so far as we know, have not been cheating on their end. They are not parties to the START treaty, but there's a lot of cheating potential. And so far as we know, they have not been cheating. So. Thank you. Sir? Hi, uh, my name is Ed Albrecht from Mercy College. Okay. First of all, thanks for your talk sure. and for the optimism. Yet, I'm not still convinced. No. Uh, and the reason is because you've, you've given us a list of material reasons for which we should all be happier. But yet, spiritually or psychologically, it seems like the trend is going in a different direction. Uh, you started with a joke about God, so I... Okay. I, I'd like open to, the door. Uh, right. I'll finish with a with a with a quote supposedly by God. Not only uh, bread feeds the human soul. So I'm wondering whether we should not start a discussion about a more sort of religious or value-oriented uh, approach instead of solely a material-oriented approach. Well, materialism may be bad for our souls, but I in this book have concentrated exclusively on things that can objectively be measured. I have not ventured into the question of what, what we think of subjectively about the quality of our lives. It's just a, it's a different subject. Okay. Um, my name is uh, Larry Bridwell, and I recently visited uh, my brother who lives in Scripps Ranch, San Diego. And his wife told me, do not go to downtown San Diego because I could get hepatitis from the homeless. And the homeless, and, and when a case can be made economically, the most successful place in the world since 1945 has been California. Yeah. But this homeless situation is all the way from Sacramento to San Diego, every step, almost every city. And so what does it say? And, then, and, the, and in the case of my uh, two nephews, they're living at home because they can't afford to leave the house. So you say everything has gotten positive, but the California I grew up in was uh, foot free, fancy. I mean, everybody could get housing. And now it's, it's a real serious problem throughout the entire state. So I'm not sure about this optimism, especially when it comes to housing. Well, I, you're, talking about the you're talking about the most expensive housing market in the United States and in part of the world when you talk about the coast of California. But I, I think I began by saying I am not claiming that everything's fine for everyone. And, and if you've got nephews that are having trouble getting out of the house, I certainly don't claim that that's exactly how they were hoping to live. Within any family, you can always find someone that things are not going how they hoped for. Well, else? Let me ask you a question. Mm -hmm. Why do you think people wanted to believe Donald Trump, that everything was so bad? The want to believe is a very puzzling question. I propose in this book that there are four basic ways of knowing. One is certainty. The sun is 93 million miles from the earth. We're certain of that. There's nothing to talk about. Another is faith, faith versus doubt. Who, who, where's the faith question from? I'm sorry, I missed you. There you are. Another is faith versus doubt. We can neither prove nor disprove the existence of God. We can speculate, but based, based on current knowledge, the question of does God exist is impossible to answer or to refute. Maybe at some point in the future it will be, but this is, this is a category of knowing where we just, all there is is wonderment. And then there's a third category that's opinion, what beer tastes best, who should have won the Super Bowl, who's the best basketball player, it's impossible, there's no right or wrong answer to questions like that, there's only your opinion. And then there's what you want to believe. 
And what you want to believe is stronger than the, all other categories of knowing combined. The strongest possible kind of belief is what you want to believe. And 63 million people in the fall of 2016 wanted to believe that everything about America, America is bad, 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 down, 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 terrible, terrible, terrible. It wasn't just that they weren't crazy about Hillary Clinton was not the world's best candidate. We all know that. She, she could have done a much better job. But it wasn't just that they didn't think that she was the world's best candidate. People wanted to believe that the United States was falling apart. And the people who voted for Brexit in the UK, by and large, they wanted to believe that the European Union was a terrible thing for citizens of Britain. And why people want to believe this, why people want to believe bad things, I wish I had the answer. The, the only thing that I can tell you that I think is, since I just said I only want to be object, ob, I want to dwell on what's objective, not subjective. This thought line has been in American culture, not for decades, but for centuries. I start one chapter on, I have a chapter on why people want to believe bad things. And it's speculative, because I don't think you can prove what people's inner motivations are. But I start that chapter by citing great works of literature nonfiction books, novels, and plays that said that America was about to fall apart, that said that everything was coming unglued and the world was ending, and citing the reasons that they said, big reason that was constantly cited was illegal immigration, illegal immigrants pouring into the country, ruining our culture, how terrible everything was, and how it was great in the past, back in those good old days, you know, you can never, we can never figure out exactly when or where they were, but there were good old days back in the past, and the good old days are now ending. And I describe these books without giving their names, and then, of course, you've already guessed what the trick is. And then I tell you their names, and all the books and plays and novels and other works of art that I refer to, they're all at least half a century old, and many of them are more than one century old. Things from the 19th century, great authors. Um, predicting that America was right on the verge of falling apart. And it hasn't happened, but this thought has been in our collective consciousness pretty much the entire time the country has existed. Ma'am. Yeah. Um, Susan Gittleson, may we internationalize this conversation? America is one thing, but every day we read about uh, Syria, for example, where half the population has had to flee, the Rohingya in Myanmar. There were terrible things going on, and many, many people, unfortunately, are insecure, have lost their homes, have lost family members, uh, are feeling terrible, and often don't have enough to eat, don't have proper uh, health care or anything. Now, uh, we read about this every day, and it must be true, uh, how do you balance all of this? How do you balance it? That's a, that's a good question. Obviously, as, as I said, there are horrible things happening in the world. And we, use, we were talking about your family a moment ago. If you look at the human family, the human family, most of its members are actually doing pretty well. But there are members of the human family that terrible things are happening to. Syria is one. Burma is one. Parts of Africa, horrible things are happening. How do you balance them? I, I will say this, that within, within our own families, if most of the family is doing pretty well and a few, one member or a few members are not doing well, the members who are doing pretty well generally get together and try to help the other member. The same is exactly true with the human family. We should do more to Syria. We've tried to help them by dropping bombs on them. And amazingly, it hasn't worked. Uh, but there's many places you can find around the world where we should be doing more than we do, and we should be doing constructive things, not dropping bombs. And, and, not, and I'm, not, I'm certainly not a pacifist, but I just think if you're going to be objective, you look at Syria, you look at Libya, dropping bombs does not work. It's not a solution to political problems. So we should, we should help the other members of the human family. But that's what we should do. What are we doing? You're dealing with what's actually going on. Right, and, that, and you, if you, I have a chapter in here on why democracy, why democracy usually defeats dictatorship, and I go into some of those issues in that chapter. George, sir, just under uh, reasons to Could believe. Could you please introduce yourself? Oh, I'm sorry, George Paik. Thank you. Okay. And I, uh, under reasons to believe things are bad, I just wondered if you had a chance to look at something that I can't remember where I saw it that said 
Misery doesn't cause revolutions, but rising expectations does. And I don't know if you've had a chance to look at that, if you've debunked it, or, or if it's useful at all. I cite that there, there are a number of social scientists who work in that field, and the one, the one I like is a woman named Carol Graham, who's at Brookings and the University of Maryland. And she has provided a great deal of documentation on exactly that point. The people base their feelings of happiness or unhappiness about their society based on whether they think their lives will improve in the future, not based on how their lives are today. So we've had so much improvement in the United States and also the European Union in the post-war era. That it's just not real. You know, our houses are twice as big as they used to be if you look in the aggregate, uh, square footage of houses. It's not realistic to think that the next generation of houses will be twice as big again. The, 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 th the thought that our material existence is going to continue to improve with the previous space is not a realistic thought. So maybe this causes people to feel badly about their lives, even when the house that they're living in is perfectly good. And that's, that impression may be stretching to other parts of the world. In, in a sense, you want the entire world to have the diseases of affluence. So, well, they may be diseases, but they're diseases that we want everybody to have. Yes? Uh, Carol Perlman. Um, I'm very intrigued by this discussion, and, and I'm also thinking about, you know, this is the time, this is now, these are the things that are impacting us, there is a, there is a trend toward pessimism. But, but then I think about the world and the evolution, and I say, well, there was World War II. You know, where was the optimism there? That, you know, it was, it, was, it was, like you said, it was your family, and you find the family members, and this was banding together to make sure that there was a tomorrow. So I think that every generation has its, you know, has its woes and, and, and its pluses. Of course, yeah. Yeah. Of course. Um, but thank you. Sure. sure. So I have one more question. Okay. Do you think it, the two-party system in some way exacerbates the feeling oh, that you uh, have yes, to... Oh, yes, 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 yes. Could um, you speak to that for a little bit? Uh, in, in that chapter I just mentioned on democracy... My favorite democracy theorist is a guy named Larry Diamond at Stanford. And I cite some of his work about uh, on two points. One is that the United States has to be the beacon to the world in democracy, and we're not doing a very good job in the last 10 years in inspiring the world democratically. And secondly, how would we clean up our own house so that we're more democratic here? And one obvious one is direct election of the president. The Electoral College was a great idea in the 18th century. It's not the 18th century anymore. And it's not just that, that Donald Trump wouldn't be president if we didn't have the Electoral College. A lot of other faults of our presidential elections that are un totally unrelated to, to Trump would, would not have happened. Diamond has a theory about breaking up the party duopoly, so it's easier for there to be third, candidate, third parties and independent candidates switching to rank choice voting, which works in... Maine and San Francisco and the small number of places that it's been tried and would be great if it worked everywhere, how to revise primaries. He's got a bunch of theories about how to improve the quality of democracy in the United States, and I, I roll the drums for them pretty big in this book. Sir. John Richardson. Um, I'm just curious about how your uh, approach would... Uh, say something good about the Dark Ages or the Black Death, because most of us who they were uh, bad. read, they read history or anything go back further than that. We don't right. discuss the Black Death or the Dark Ages. Mm -hmm. We discuss Greek and Roman civilization. Of course. But if it's been an upward curve all the way, I guess I should stop looking for Greek, Greek aphorisms and <laughs> Roman quotes. But Well, I would kind of hope that we've gone uphill since the Black Death. So that would... <laughs> <laughs> But is there is any statistical evidence that civilization was progressing during the Dark Ages? I know, you know, you know there were figures about how many people died in the Black Death, but you know, the Dark Ages seems would to you be say that we don't know anything about. Well, maybe I, you do. I, I wouldn't claim to be knowledgeable on whether you could say that civilization was progressing during the Dark Ages. I can tell you that if you look at charts, several modern economists have done charts of the reduction... You can do it one or two ways, the reduction of poverty per capita or, or the increase of prosperity per capita. And both of them changed very little from the Greeks and the Romans till about the year 1800. 
and then started to accelerate in, a, in an amazing way. Obviously, we're much better at building things than we used to be, and we're much better at finding and using resources than we used to be. That's only one of many things that has to happen for a good society, but boy, are we better at that than we used to be. There are no more questions. I'd like to invite you all to continue the conversation. You've given us a lot of good things to think about, so I thank you very much. Sure for It's better than it looks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.